Did you sense the rough nature of the scripture lesson today? Very rough and pointed. Now I've been cautioned at times in ministry, at least one time, that as I've been sort of looked over by others, that they can see the tendency to sort of give more challenge in scriptures and lessons, sermons, devotionals, as opposed to something that's sort of a little bit sweeter, encouraging, and uplifting. And as I've wrestled with that and looked at scripture, I think I'm still quite confused as to how to avoid what James brings us today. And maybe that's the thing. We can't avoid it. The challenge is there for us, and it's pointed at us today in, a very same, in the very same way that it was pointed to those that received it in the days that it was written. It was written to believers. And we stand here, or sit here, as the believers that can hear tough words and consider them for our benefit. And if we can't, we have to find a way to get there. The scripture is not always gentle. Sometimes it feels forceful. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? It does not make us feel good to consider that we have imperfections. You want something and do not have it, so you commit murder. Wait, what? And of course, James is talking about the murder of character, or speaking so ill of someone, it's as if you are murdering them. And you covet something and cannot obtain it. So you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. Adulterers! How cruel that is to say to a group of wonderful people like you. And it really is. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? If you wish to be a friend of God, you, if you wish to be a friend of the world, you become an enemy of God. Or do you suppose that it is for nothing that the scripture says, God yearns jealously for the spirit that he has made dwell in us, but he gives all the more grace Therefore it said, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into dejection. Humble yourselves, therefore, before the Lord, and He will exalt you. Those words are rough. Have you ever had a craving in life that has been good for you? I don't know. When you think of cravings, what do you think of? What is it? Chocolate, yes. How many chocolate lovers out there? Yeah, a lot of chocolate lovers. I'm, I'm one of them. In fact, I, uh, within the, you know, as I got smart and discovered the joy of dark chocolate, now I love dark chocolate. When I was younger, of course, you're, you're dumb. You don't know yet how amazing dark chocolate is yet. Um, but chocolate is associated with cravings, for sure. Um, yeah. Is chocolate good for you? 
<laughs> Everybody wants to say yes, right? We want to find the reasons. I always love watching the news shows when they're like, especially like the morning shows and things once you get into like the, the second hour and things like that. And, you know, you'll have all these stories about how good wine is for you and like, you, I mean, like coffee, you know, coffee's great for you. We, we always want to sort of find these good things. I mean, there are bad things about them, of course, too, right? We can find these bad traits. Um, but chocolate, it's a mixed bag, I think, right? It's, uh, it's a mixed bag. What else might you crave? Or what do you think of when you think of cravings? Attention. That's great. Great, great thought. Because uh, you, it's, it's much more easily identified in children. You see it uh, with, with young people. It, it doesn't matter what kind of attention it is sometimes. They'll just, I mean, it can be, they can act out and be bad to get that attention too, right? So not always a good thing to have that craving for attention. Um, it definitely points to a lack somewhere, doesn't it? Something's missing. Could that possibly be true with those things like chocolate? Might be. Might be that something's missing. And so there's a craving. There's this, this thing that, whatever it may be, that needs to get filled, that need. Right? Whenever we have cravings, it's probably true that something's not quite right. Something's probably missing. I think of, uh, when I think of cravings, I think of pregnant women. And the cravings that are just bizarre. Things that happen where it's like, you know, you think of those stereotypical scenarios where the husband has to go out at like 2 in the morning to find this crazy thing and all the stores are closed. Any, anyone ever experienced that kind of thing? Yeah? What do you got? Pickles. That's what I, that's what I think of actually as the thing about pregnancy cravings for some reason. Pickles. Weird. What is it? I still didn't catch it. Clams. Clams. I'm sorry. Um, steamed clams. That's just weird. Yeah. I'm not a clam lover, though, so I, you know, I, I can do it. But, yeah. And pickled eggs. And pickled eggs. There's the pickle thing again. Um, yeah, we got. Cottage cheese. Mm. You, you just can't predict the kind of things that might come up. You just never know. It could be just anything. There is a restaurant that markets itself on cravings. Does anybody know what it could be? White Castle, is it? Who here loves White Castle? Are you ashamed to raise your hand? Here's the thing I do too. <laughs> so I'm with you. I'm one of those awful weirdos. And I can remember going down to Port Newark at 2 and 3 in the morning go on board a ship and be a captain and do, do some work. And there's a, there's a uh, White Castle that I would stop at on the way home. And I don't understand what it is about this craving, but I estimated at some point that 90% of the time that I would eat it, I would feel awfully sick. And I would still take that trip down to Newark and still want that thing again and again. And I truly was like, it's like 90% of the time I feel like garbage. I shouldn't do that to my body. There is something about cravings that really do hurt us. It feels great to sort of 
scratch that itch, and yet it can be so harmful. We can think we're satisfied, but it uncovers something else that's missing. Regarding conflicts and disputes, he says, those conflicts and disputes, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and don't have it, so you commit murder. There's so much here that I can't speak to this morning, but I certainly want to speak to the cravings that come out within us. We will never truly be transparent when we're dealing with cravings. We legitimize them. We don't talk about these things that we want in life as cravings. That minimizes it. We speak about them as if they are legitimate things that are necessities, that are good. We find justifications. And what is it really all about? It somehow is about us so much as individuals that we step into a role of force that's unnecessary and unhealthy. Those cravings when we want something become legitimate in our world that we create. He also talks about it as coveting. And then he talks about asking and not getting it because you ask for the wrong things, the wrong reasons. All of this scripture, these ten verses, are really truly speaking to something that's in line with this flow of James, of this whole book. And it has something to do with pride versus humility. Remember last week, two of a kind, two of different kinds, and we talked about Psalm 1. We talked about James, the end of James here, James 3. Two kinds of wisdom. There's the worldly thing and there's the godly wisdom. He actually sort of creates that dichotomy here too where he says that you can be, you can pursue friendship with the world, right? And become an enemy of God or you can pursue friendship with God and God and he, he doubles down on that. He says, just a few verses later, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Right? There's that part. Resist and he flees. But then he says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. He's creating this, this twofold kind of way of thinking of the spirit world versus the, the, the physical flesh world. The things that we want versus the things that God wants. And that's truly what it comes down to as he's talking through all of these things. I'm going to close with this because I don't want to get too long with this, but I really want you to see this beautiful connection with chapter 1 and how it ties together. If I can find it. I didn't, I didn't mark it. Christian beliefs or something like that. 
but, but specifically to James, being double-minded has to do with faith. And it has to do with what he says in chapter 1 about being like a wave and being tossed to and fro. And he says here in James 1, but ask in faith, never doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For the doubter, being double-minded and unstable in every way, must not expect to receive anything from the Lord. And you see that sounds almost like that belongs in the same section, doesn't it? It sounds like those things could be exactly tied together. Here's the point. When we want to make something happen because we have something at war within us and we want to just will it to happen regardless of what God wants, it's because we are double-minded. It's because we are lacking a faith. And when God is telling us one thing and we're going the opposite way, why would we possibly go that opposite way? It's because we have doubt. And so today, God wants to speak into your life and to be heard and obeyed. Not because of his powerful fear that he can inflict, but because we know that God has the absolute best in mind for us. I love this. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he flee from you. Draw near to God, and he'll draw near to you. But he says, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. In our cravings, we don't submit. We submit to God. So, when you have that thing that's the spiritual or real world, real life equivalent, you know that this thing and following that craving will hurt you 90% of the time. You will feel the effects and be absolutely miserable when we experience that. It's not your strength and your power your will to resist, it's submitting to God. It's the opposite of what we would think. We think that we need to be strong in that scenario, but we simply submit and rely on God's strength. Can you apply that to anything in your life today? Can you say, Lord, I struggle with this decision. I have it happen all the time. I mean, Jess and I have, you know, real world examples of things that, especially with our kids, things that we would love for our kids to experience. Even recently, we've had these things come into our lives that seem like opportunities, and yet, we recognize that it's like a craving. Like, well, that would be so good for Justin to have that experience. He, he would certainly be more prepared for high school and without getting into all the craziness and the details and the weirdness of personal things. It's there. Those cravings happen for all of us. We have to submit. What is it, God, that you want? How do you do that? The very best thing that James will tell you is to get in his word. Slow down and pray. And so, as we continue in James next week, let's bring with us this understanding less of me more of God. If we insist on our cravings, we'll be sick 90% of the time. That's for sure. Lord, help us to submit ourselves to you. Amen.